Tech Reimagined. Redefining the relationship between people and technology. Brought to you by Andava. This is Tech Reimagined. Hello, I'm Bradley Howes and I'm happy to welcome you back to the latest episode of Tech Reimagined. Joining us today is John Byers. He's a partner and commercial solicitor at Osborne Clark. And the topic of today's episode is the combination of IT services and next generation technology. Hello, John. It's lovely to have you here. Can you tell us a bit more about yourself and your background? Yes, I'm a technology partner at Osborne Clark. I lead the commercial services team there. Uh, and we deal with all things transactional and all things technology. And uh, I also lead the AI the international AI team uh, and typically advise uh, businesses that are looking to implement or deploy AI solutions. What led me into the uh, the IT services industry? Well, I started in a city law firm. It was called then Denton Hall. It's now, I think, called Denton's. And that was my first introduction to the world of technology and transactions. Uh, and I was simply fascinated by it. And it led me into a career path where I moved from Denton's to a, to an IT company by the name of LNX, and uh, which back in the day was a was a PC manufacturer, and um, I got involved in my first substantial IT services transactions at, at that particular point. It was simply simply my my milieu. And the transactions got bigger and bigger. The values got higher and higher. And the issues got more and more complex. And it was just a natural path for me to tread. And then I moved into a business called Capgemini, which is a very famous IT services provider and ended up running some very, very large international transactions. What I loved about IT services was that you are pulling together a wide variety of different disciplines. And not only do you have to write the agreement, but you also have to act a bit like a cowboy. You have to kind of corral everyone into a particular pen. And it's difficult with um, IT services people because they're a bit like um, cats. You can't you can't really herd them and they've all got their own opinion. They've famously over opinionated. But anyway, you, you've got to kind of project manage them and then you've got to be a diplomat as well so you've got not only have you got to get your own side aligned you've got to get the other side uh, on on the same page as well uh, and uh, I'm very much a people person so it's the people aspect of the job that uh, that I really love and uh, I've over the course of uh, the 25 years or so that I've been working in IT services I've really seen the industry transition from a model where the businesses were using big on-premise uh, IT systems uh, and uh, taking big transfers of people when IT departments were moved across to a situation where services are being transitioned into the cloud and where the people element is significantly more and more being replaced by technology such as artificial intelligence, which was indirectly how I got into uh, advising on artificial intelligence in the first place. Well, thank you and welcome to the show. So in those 20 years, presumably, um, you've seen uh, projects migrate from a massive requirements document at the start of a project, which is quite easy for in the um, from a legal perspective to say, you have done this, you haven't done that, into much more of a fluid and agile approach now, which is, we want some teams, this is uh, generally where we want to be going. So how has that changed from a legal perspective? Yeah, again, and it's a bit of a, a bit of a trope, isn't it? But, you know, the law always seems to catch up. It always seems to be late to the party. And uh, I think that's one of the areas in particular in IT services where we've really had to evolve the way in which IT services contracts have been drafted because traditionally they've always been drafted, certainly in an integration or a development situation, they've always been drafted on a kind of waterfall methodology with a very detailed specification and, a, you know, a big checkbox or a cross at the end where the customer accepts the solution to a more agile situation. And what I found really interesting is that there's a remarkable lack of understanding. Given that agile development has been around now for a pretty long time, there's a remarkable lack of understanding, and you must come across this, Bradley, as well, a remarkable lack of understanding in the professional services legal industry about how agile developments actually work. And we... Um, a couple of years ago, actually, we we deconstructed it all with uh, with a, ba a major IT services client, and we created a an agile template, and we went into kind of the intricacies of Moscow requirements and uh, scrums and um, sprints, kind of codified that into a cogent document. 
which I think is still class leading to this day, but I would say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and when you said opinionated before, I'm, I'm hoping that present company is, is excluded from that. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, so governments and industry are really promoting STEM, that's science, technology, engineering and mathematics subjects in, in education. Are there still enough people studying law? Yeah, it's, it's still very much uh, oversubscribed, but certainly... My, my two teenage kids, I would, I would have cautioned against them ent entering the legal profession at the moment because I think it's uh, very uh, competitive and it's frankly very, very hard to get, to get a, a decent role. And I think um, potentially um, from my own, the perspective of my own professional practice, this is, a, this is an area which could be um, operationalized by the introduction of technology. And again, that's a, that's a bit of a meme that seems to run through the conversation circles that I'm in. That when, are the, when are the machines going to take over your job? But um, there's, a core, there's a kernel of truth to it. I think professional services are potentially, uh, such as legal services and accountancy services, potentially some of the most vulnerable industries to the, the wave of automation. I'm, I'm quite surprised at, at that answer because uh, one of my closest... Um, dearest friends is uh, he's he's a patent attorney, and I think that is the best job in the world because you only get to, by definition you only get to work with people who are inventing stuff, coming up with brand new concepts, trying to work out what makes that different, and and work with the inventors. It just sounds absolutely fantastic, and you're also helping to protect them from from being copied. It just sounds absolutely brilliant. So you get to work with technology and the inventors and law. Sounded brilliant. Yeah, and I, I think, look, I mean, uh, there's a qualification to what I'm saying, Bradley, which is that so far as the law is concerned um, uh, and other professional services, there is always going to be, it's like a pyramid, there's always going to be, at the apex of the pyramid, there's always going to be a demand for premium strategic legal or prof other professional services that customers are going to be willing to pay for. Where the operationalization actually occurs is in the base of the pyramid, where there's all this commoditized work that... Uh, just can be handed off to machines. And I think we're seeing that happen at the moment with automated due diligence solutions and document review solutions that are being implemented at the moment. So uh, if you're going to be a lawyer, and it's a roundabout answer to your question, if you're going to be a lawyer, become an AI lawyer like me, and then, or a patent lawyer like your mate, so that you're actually, uh, you know, you're in a position to control the new technologies as they're being developed. And how early on do you recommend um, companies or, or teams engage you um, during that kind of ideation process to actually writing code um, to start thinking about the legal perspective? I mean, you mentioned before about Agile and sprints. So do you really think that a lawyer should be involved every two weeks? And I'm not talking from a billing perspective, John. Well, <laughs> talking about something close to my heart. No, um, I think... Uh, uh, you'd expect me to say involve us as soon as possible, but I really do appreciate the pragmatic, practical constraints to hiring external counsel because we can we can be quite expensive. I don't think we need to be involved in every single sprint. I think that's overkill. But what we do need to be involved in is the creation of a document, a, a suitable framework, which, which protects the interests of both parties. And the only way that we can do that adequately and efficiently is to understand precisely what it is that's going to be done right at the very beginning. So, you know, the optimal model will be to have a consultation with an external counsel before you start then you go through ideation and while you're doing that we create the the framework within which the agile development takes place and then ultimately we'll negotiate it um, but don't leave us right until the last moment because you'll end up with a half-baked solution yeah so my predictions on a regulatory front, we're inevitably going, and this is less of a prediction than an, than an inevitability, we're going to see more regulation in the IT services space through uh, regulations such as the AI Act. Uh, and that is really going to influence the way in which IT services are delivered in the UK and in Europe. And the point I would make here is that uh, there's a real concern that that particular Act is going to create a bunch of compliance hurdles, which may actually act to dis disincentivize the provision of IT services within Europe. Uh, it's certainly going to create um, a, 
a high number of uh, regulatory hurdles. So that's potentially going to change the shape of the way in which IT services are being delivered. And my prediction there is that Europe is going to move more towards traditional IT services and away from AI. Um, I need to think about the other two, Bradley. <laughs> that, that's okay. That's okay. Um, in in your experience, what, what are the industries that are um, adopting AI the quickest from let's say your clients, you don't need to mention them by name, but which industries? Again, another very good question. I think the industries that are adopting AI, uh, the ones that are computational, computationally intensive uh, and need to make volume decisions. So I'm not categorizing them by sector at the moment. So, and equally speaking, they can be operationalized relatively straightforwardly. So to put typical businesses within that bucket, Clearly, the financial services industry, in the context of having to make uh, high volume decisions about eligibility for products and services, uh, has ma- massively embraced artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning as a, as a as a solution. Likewise, insurance, which is again highly operationalized in terms of the volume of decisions that it's making in terms of um, underwriting policies of insurance and risk. You know, we've already talked about professional services such as accountancy and the legal profession. I think they're following close bef- behind, but in that situation, it will be services that are more at the commoditized end rather than the strategic end. So those are the kind of class leaders when it comes to industry. I think the rest of the the rest of the industries are, are following behind. Um, I'm seeing it permeate every sector uh, in quite an insidious way. Uh, back to IT services, can you share with us um, what are the most common causes for which IT service providers are in a bit of legal hot bother for? I think they boil down to um, basic human dynamics. And it's just like any other interaction you would have with any other person. So where you've misrepresented what your service can do, then you will get into a lot of trouble. And I've seen that time and time again, where salespeople on the IT services side have missold a particular service, it's failed to deliver the results, and litigation has resulted. And of course, the big the big one on that front was the B Sky B and EDS case, which happened a few years back, when EDS, which no longer exists, misrepresented its its platform to to Sky. Poor commercials are another one. Uh, in my experience, and I will I will not name names to uh, to spare the guilty, but um, I've seen, for example, service levels that have been crafted in a way which are frankly impossible to achieve, and you combine that with a uh, service credit remedy schedule which is quite expensive has caused suppliers to frankly hemorrhage money and there was one particular deal where uh, in the public sector inevitably where the supplier really lost money for the term of the agreement it didn't make any money at all uh, and that was through poor hygiene in the creation of the the back the back end schedules it's rarely anything to do with the front end. The front end, what you tend to find in the IT services is the front end or the front end terms and conditions are usually overcrafted and are usually polished and are fantastic. It's the interaction between the schedules and the back end with the front end is where the vulnerability um, is created. What, what do you mean by front end and back end? This is kind of lawyer speak, so sorry, Bradley, but the, uh, the, fr- the front end would be the set of formal terms and conditions that define the transaction. So you'd have a set of T's and C's for an outsourcing or for an integration or for a development. And that would be typically crafted by a, you know, a, a law firm or internal counsel. And, then behind, and that refers to a set of schedules. So things like the SLAs, the service description, if there's one, the timelines for the project, change control, things things like that that are kind of ancillary to the to the main main project. Though it's the, it's in those schedules where most of the mistakes happen, and in not ensuring that the schedules communicate properly with the front end. Typically, in the service delivery elements of the schedules, we we I can't draft a service specification because I'm a lawyer. I'm not a I'm not a a service delivery person. So we rely on the service delivery people to draft that. If they make a mistake, then it's on them. They've, they've created an issue for themselves. And are the litigation circumstances becoming more complex? Are you saying, seeing the same issues happen now as in almost 20 years ago? How's it changing? I think what we're seeing, uh, again, uh, as, so far as market indicators are concerned, I think we're seeing an increased appetite on the part of customers to take on suppliers 
when they're unhappy with an outcome. So certainly the appetite for litigation is higher, which is potentially worrying outcome for IT services providers. We've been involved in a number of technology disputes. I, I work with, uh, not through any contracts that we've created, but you know we've been instructed separately. And I work with my litigation colleagues on the dispute side um, in relation to number of disputes with suppliers and with customers, uh, which we've had to sort out. And my role in that situation is to try and talk people off a precipice and get them to a workable solution or a workaround which which will fit both parties. But if that doesn't happen, then we retreat back to the trenches and uh, open fire, metaphorically. Uh, good old fashion communication principles uh, and finally um when you and i both started in, in this industry um uh, there were much more it services companies providing hosting solutions literally that the servers and, and managing those but with the event of cloud computing where me- most of the it services companies are now uh, recommending clients start using amazon google microsoft um, and any of the other cloud vendors, uh, surely that removes some of the litigation circumstances. I, I remember we're starting out in the industry and when we were responsible for our, our client's servers, if there was a problem there with downtime, it was us who were liable. But now it's all passed on to the cloud providers, isn't it? It could be in some situations, but I think in some situations it could actually increase your propensity to be sued for a situation you're not able to control. And this is something I'm seeing very much in the industry at the moment. Um, And you're absolutely right, Bradley. Um, We are now moving to AWS and Azure and using those platforms. But the lawyers and the delivery people that are setting up these SaaS delivered solutions are forgetting that when they're they're putting their solution into the cloud, they're relying on the terms and conditions of Azure, Microsoft Azure or Amazon uh, and AWS. And they're not allowing the enterprise license from those SaaS providers to influence their own terms and conditions. I have to say this time and time again, I'm running about six SaaS or cloud uh, platform transactions at the moment. You would be amazed at how often, and some incredibly large organizations are involved, they have mislicensed their core enterprise license with AWS or with Azure to the point where they are forbidden under that license from providing a hosting service to their customers. I, I see it time and time again. They ignore the terms of their core SaaS license, and that is going to create more, more issues because, frankly, the, the core SaaS providers can simply turn the solution off. I don't quite understand. What do you mean by mislicensed from the cloud provider? So you'll get a situation where you have a tier of license that the customer has taken from the SaaS provider, which only allows for personal internal use and does not allow them to use the hosted platform for onward use to their customers. So basically, they're out of license the moment they offer their solution to a third party. It's as simple as that. Right. Wow. And, and are these on large projects? Yeah. Yeah. You would be, you would be surprised. I'm t- we're talking about um, organizations that measure their turnover in the billions of dollars and not the millions. Household names. Wow. Well. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. We won't delve any deeper on that one. Uh, John, it, it's been really insightful having you on the show today. Thank you so much for, for sharing some of your um, your expertise and, and these anecdotes. To all of our listeners, I hope you've enjoyed today's episode of Tech Reimagined and thank you for joining. Please show us some love and hit that subscribe button if you liked the episode. And don't forget to tell your friends and colleagues about the show. If you have any questions or want to reach out or get any feedback, please drop us a line at endava.com or use the at endava handle on most of the social media platforms. We look forward to hearing from you. Until next time, it's been a pleasure.